so glad that you are here. Glad to have those of you that are listening with us today at home. Uh, it's great to see you here. Um, you know, I got my hair cut this week. My sister cuts my hair. And she doesn't accept, she won't accept any money uh, from me for it. But her husband had a great idea. He said, you know, you wear that alb at church. What if we just on the back of your alb, we put sponsored by Jenny's Salon. <laughs> well, at first I thought that idea has a lot of promise. But upon consideration, I decided, no, we're going to just stick with our main sponsor. Our main sponsor is on the front, this guy right here. So you're here to worship him. I invite you to let go of your fears, let go of your anxieties, and set your heart free to just give him delight and praise and jubilation this day and watch how that lifts your spirits and, and lifts your life. Our opening hymn will stay seated and then stand on the last verse. In 
his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospels according to St. Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. And so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? He was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated for
Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My text is the Gospel text, which was read from Matthew chapter 22. Well, thinking back over my career, I'm pretty sure I've probably done over uh, 200 weddings, and I remember a lot. In fact, I, I probably remember something from almost all of them, and they've been marvelous. It's fun to do weddings. I've done them in wonderful settings. I've done weddings in beautiful churches, I've done beach weddings and park weddings and botanical garden weddings. I've met marvelous people. I usually do about five weeks of pre-marriage counseling with the couple, so I get to know them really well, and, and I've met the most extraordinary people that way. And, not least, I have seen the most beautiful bride's dresses. You know, over 200 weddings, and I've never seen a bride that didn't look stunningly beautiful. Every single one of them did. There, there was one one time that tried really hard not to. <laughs> she had on a short dress and it was barely long enough and black boots that came up over her knees with buckles all the way up and about 15 pieces of metal in her lips and her ears and her, and her nose and her hair dyed a very unnatural color but I do have to say at that moment when she stepped into the aisle and all eyes were on her and she was going to come forward to take her vows really her face was radiant she was beautiful too. And so I can say honestly, I have never seen a bride that was not gorgeous. But the weddings that I remember the best are the ones with the really fantastic banquets afterward. <laughs> Does that surprise you? I mean, look at me. If I have any problem in life, I said I like food way too much. My favorite wedding, let me tell you about it if you don't mind. I did a wedding when I was in Hawaii for a couple um, their parents were Samoan. The, the father was a, a master gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. And nobody told me that every Samoan in Hawaii was going to show up for this <laughs> wedding. That church was packed from bow to stern. And it was marvelous. I fell in love with Samoan culture. I'll tell you, the Samoan men are all muscular and handsome. The Samoan women are all beautiful and, and graceful. They're a very spiritual people. They love their families. And boy, do they know how to celebrate. The banquet after this wedding was the most amazing thing. I, I found out that in Samoa, not only do the guests give a gift to the new married couple, but the families give gifts to the elders and the matriarch of the community for coming to the, the wedding. So here are these beautiful bridesmaids, right, dressed in those flowery island dresses, you know, with legs around their necks and flowers in their hair. And they would come running in, and they'd bring a check to the matriarch, and she would wave it in the air, and all the people would cheer. And then the bridesmaids went, and they did a hula dance for everybody. <laughs> and then the groomsmen came out, and they're just wearing loincloths, and they got leaves in their hair and kukui nut blades. And they do this dance to the drums. Boom, 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 boom. And they're beating their chest, you know, beating their thighs. And it was the most amazing. <laughs> and they told me that in Samoa, the, the pastor who does the wedding normally would get a pig as his payment. Well, they can't give me a live pig at the wedding at the banquet hall there in Hawaii. And what would I do with a live pig anyway? But at the time where it was where I was introduced, then uh, one of the bridesmaids came running in, and she had a great big huge ham, and she gave me the ham, and everybody was, was cheering. But the most amazing thing of all was the food. Course after course after course of all different kinds of Pacific Ocean fishes prepared all different ways. Sushis and sashimis and tropical fruits and vegetables and coconut bread and chicken dishes and oceanic salads and hams and roasted pork and, and then the laughter and the noise and the joy. I'll never forget that. That was the most fun I've ever had at any wedding. Uh, except my own time. Because <laughs> you were there at mine. <laughs> well, our text today increases that sense of tension that we've been observing the last few weeks during Holy Week between Jesus and the religious leaders. And so Jesus tells another parable. And it's quite clear that Jesus' adversaries there fit right into the role of the antagonists of the king in this parable. And so he tells a parable about a king who has a wedding feast for his son. 
And in light of the way that it's described, there's, the, there's this eschatological undertone to the whole thing, right? For example, when they cast out the improperly dressed attendee into outermost darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that's Jesus' most common expression for someone being thrown into what we would call hell. So this is not just an ordinary banquet or a story about a regular wedding. This is about the marriage supper of the Lamb. This idea that there's going to be a great wedding feast when, the, the, when Christ, the Lamb of God, marries his bride one day in the consummated kingdom. It's touched on in the Old Testament. For example, the Isaiah 25 passage that George read talks about the feast that will occur on that day. And it's described elsewhere about how the restoration that God is going to bring when the Messiah comes is going to bring a time of feasting. It's picked up then by Jewish liter literature and rabbinic literature. And then it's made more clear in the New Testament in passages like Isaiah chapter 5, where it talks about Christ the bridegroom and, and church being the bride of Christ. In Revelation 19 and 21, where it talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb. But it's the harsh and almost non-realistic actions in the, the story that seem so extreme to us and catch our attention, right? Like, who kills somebody who delivers them an invitation to a wedding? And who destroys somebody and burns their city just because they RSVP no to an invitation to a wedding? And who has a party and happens to see a guest at the party that they don't think is dressed nice enough. And so they have their hands and feet tied together and they throw them into, into darkness. What kind of stuff is that in this story? Well, it all has to be understood as dimensions of the story in which the earthly parts of the story are sharing and overlapping with non-earthly, ultimate, end of the world eternal consummation kind of stuff of God's great banquet feast for his son. On that day when the universe is going to come down to its final showdown, those who are with God and those who are against God, there are no other options at that point. So the stakes are not just huge, they're exhausting. They're all embracing. How would you say this parable works? What would you say that it's trying to tell us or what it means? You, you know what helps me get a better handle on this text? It's comparing it to a similar parable in Luke's gospel. This story doesn't occur in Mark or John, but in Luke 14, there is also a parable of the wedding banquet. Well, let me read it to you, if you don't mind. But he said to them, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and byways and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. You know, back when I was in high school, I went to a, uh, a, a high school age uh, Sunday school class. And the wife of the man that taught the class, she put together these booklets with all kinds of songs that were taken right from the Bible. So we would start each class singing songs. And you know what's great about something like that? Is that when you learn some scripture through a song, it kind of sticks with you and you help remember. So here I am, uh, two years later, and uh, I still remember a, one of the songs that came from this parable in Luke. A certain man held a feast on a fine estate in town. He set a festive table and wore a wedding gown. He sent invitations to his neighbors far and wide. But when the meal was ready, each of them replied, I cannot come. 
I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble me now. I have married me a wife, I have bought me a cow, I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused, I cannot come. <laughs> now, that's why I know that parable from Lou better than I do this one from Matthew. The parables are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. Sometimes Jesus would tell a parable, presumably he told it at length, and the different gospel writers would draw on different things from that story. But also, it seems much more likely in this case and in some other cases, that Jesus told certain parables more than once, and that he changed things in the parable depending on the context and the circumstance in which he was addressing it. So what is he saying here with this parable in Luke? It seems pretty easy, doesn't it? Luke is the gospel writer who's most concerned about inclusion of outsiders. He's the one that tells the most stories about Samaritans and tax collectors and, and Gentiles and women and how the kingdom is going to include these who have previously been excluded or were on the margins. And so in Luke's telling, you can see what his interest is here, right? Go into the streets and the lanes and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And when there's still room, do what? Go into the highways and the byways and compel people to come in. The ones who were first invited won't taste of the banquet. So Luke is looking at how the ones who were first invited declined the invitations and that results in the, the compulsions to bring in all kinds of other people, people like us who would not have been invited otherwise. Now in Matthew, the servants of the king still go out and they gather other people off the streets to take the places of those who didn't come. But Matthew doesn't elaborate on that dimension of the story the way Luke does. I won't go over all the ways in which Matthew and Luke differ here, but I want to hit on four that I think help us then understand what, what Matthew's concern is with this parable, what he is trying to tell us. One the king in Matthew's parable sends out the invites twice. Did you notice that when it was being read? You see how he sends out the invitation, and when they decline, he sends the servants out again to say, the food is all ready. Tell them to come right now. What does that do? By having the invitation sent out more than once, it adds to the culpability of those who did not come. Not only were they invited once, they were invited more than once to try to come. Some, second, some of the invitees in Matthew's parable end up killing the servants that deliver those invites to them. Now, do you see what that does? That starts to connect them right away to the people in the parable that immediately precedes this in Matthew's gospel, the one I preached on last week, the parable of the tenants. Remember, the, the owner of the vineyard sent people to collect the fruit from the tenants and what did the tenants do? They killed them. So here in this parable, when the, when the king sends invitations by his servants, what happens? The servants are killed. In the parable of the tenants, it was the duty of those tenants to give the vineyard its fruit. And that's why when they don't do what they're supposed to do, it makes them detestable. Here in this parable, it is not the duty of the people, but it is the graciousness of the king toward them, which is being rejected. The opportunity to celebrate with him in honor of his son, which they reject. And that is what makes them so detestable. Third, the king in Matthew's parable then destroys the ones who murdered his servants. Do you see how the parable then is trying to communicate to you just how terrible it is? And how angry it makes God when his grace is rejected. This is the very part of the parables which is so problematic for some people. I've told you before that when I prepare my sermons, I, I check a lot of different sources, even some from liberal parts of the church. And so I ran across this Presbyterian theologian who says, the king in the parable could not possibly be analogous to God because the king is so violent and ruthless. That would make God violent and ruthless. Another ELCA theologian said that this is the story your kids will never learn in Sunday school, and it's probably not conducive even to a Christian sermon unless you restrict all the harsh parts in it to just the people who were at that time in that place. 
You see, those are the kinds of sermons that you're going to get if you listen to sermons by guys who have rejected the, uh, the inspiration totally of every part of God's Word. Once there are parts of the Bible that are not as good as other parts, it's up to the pastor or the theologian to decide what's good and what's bad. Much better was the comment by an LCMS pastor who said, when you read something in the Bible that you have a problem with, the problem is probably with us. So here the judgment of the king to destroy these people who rejected his invitation, that seems really harsh, doesn't it? But our takeaway has to be that this is a very serious matter with God. Life and death serious. To refuse his grace. To refuse to honor his son. Fourth, finally, the king in Matthew's parable, once the wedding feast begins, he runs across someone at the feast who's not wearing a wedding garment. Now, it's not too much of a stretch for us to remember that there is a dress code for heaven. In heaven, you have to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 13 that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3, he says, as many of you as were baptized have been put on Christ. You know, when I was in the Navy, it was always a big deal to make sure you were in the right uniform. And then to make sure that you put the root uniform on correctly. So I didn't have too many mistakes, but the ones I did were really, really embarrassing. Like putting my collar devices on the wrong side once. Or getting dressed early in the morning when it was dark and putting on blue socks instead of black socks. Or having my shoulders on, shoulder boards on backwards when I gave a prayer to 3,000 people at once. You always hoped that, that somebody would notice that you made a mistake and get you squared away before your senior officer saw you, right? Nowadays, by the way, I don't have to worry about my uniform too much. I got, I got Dawn, she checks me before I come to church on Sunday to make sure my zipper's up and all that. <laughs> <laughs> but to get to heaven, to go to the marriage feast of the Lamb, you can't get in there unless you meet the dress code. We'll be looking down at Sunday school, if we get that far today, at the saints who are clothed in white robes. What does that mean? It means that they have righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which he gives to you as a free gift. And you appropriate it. You put that clothing, that robe on, so to speak, by faith when you trust his words that God does not hold your sins against you for Christ's sake, but counts you as righteous. So Matthew doesn't get into that very much here. Although we can make that application. Why does Matthew mention this segment about the guy without the wedding garment? I think it's because it fits up with what he's described earlier in the parable. There were those who didn't show up to the wedding because they despised the king's grace. Here we have someone who does show up to the wedding feast but he despises the king's grace too because he didn't wear the appropriate garment. And when he's asked about it by the king, he could have said, oh, I'm really sorry, or I didn't know the dress code, or let me go home and change quickly, or I didn't have the right garment. But he's silent. He's got nothing to say about it. And so he is thrown out. Not thrown out of the banquet. He's thrown out into outermost darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's like at this point, have you ever seen a play where the lights go on behind the curtain that's in the backdrop of the scene, and all of a sudden you can see things that are in the back? It's like the lights go on. Now you can see the backdrop of this story. That this is not just a story about a wedding feast and making sure that you're appropriately dressed at certain social functions, but it's a story about the terrible rejection of God's graciousness which results in people then being vectored toward eternal condemnation if they persisted. That's really important, by the way, brothers and sisters. You probably weren't going to hear that on TV or reading your favorite book today, so aren't you glad you came to church to hear that important news? <coughs> and the last thing then that Jesus says is that many are called, but few are chosen. 
I heard a Christian businessman many years ago who said, Many are called, but few are chosen. Most are cold, and a few are frozen. He was decrying the fact that he didn't see any passion or zeal or excitement among those who were chosen. So you see, this invite to heaven, this invite to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done, that goes out to the whole world. Many are called. Only those who find themselves at the marriage feast of the Lamb will discover that in their response behind it was the king himself who found them. The king who went out to the outlets of the roads and gathered them and they were chosen. So brothers and sisters, don't show up to the wedding feast with, with sad and dour faces and grumbling hearts. But gear up your minds for the banquet that is to come, the party of all parties, the celebration that will be so awesome that it cannot be described in words. What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined. What God has prepared for those who love him. So rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, <coughs> rejoice. Amen. Would you please rise and join me in confessing what all Christians believe in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under conscious life. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You be seated for the prayer. Almighty Lord, we come before you with rejoicing and filled with joy in our hearts that you have chosen us in Jesus Christ, that you have brought us to this place of faith in which we now stand, and that our salvation from start to finish has been entirely your work. How we delight to see the great love that you have lavished upon us. And so we praise your holy name, Lord, in your mercy. We want to pray then, Lord, as your redeemed children for the church, for the church all around the world, that you would raise up pastors and missionaries and give leadership to the church that is wise and follows your counsel. We pray, Lord, for those who are bringing the word of God to people in very difficult places and in very difficult settings. Lord, we ask that they would be encouraged and that they would be supported and that we would remember them in our prayers. We pray, Lord, for those who are being persecuted around the world. I heard very recently that the communist Chinese now are insisting that Christians remove crosses and religious objects and replace them with pictures of communist leaders. We pray, Lord, that you would protect our brothers and sisters in communist China and all around the world who face growing and increasing persecution, especially those, Lord, who are in danger of losing life and limb, which happens even now in the year 2020. Grant them boldness. Grant them in their suffering with Christ a security and a confidence that they are in your hands. And help those of us who, by, by uh, relation to them, enjoy so much freedom and still have so many blessings not to forget them in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. 
We pray, O Lord, that you would remove the covering that is cast over all the people, the veil that is spread over the nations, that you would swallow up death, and that you would wipe the tears from the eyes of your people. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as we wait for you, that we would be glad and rejoice when we see your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. In your prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would help us in our prayer lives to become more, more fervent, more zealous, more committed, more dedicated, and more powerful in calling upon you through this great instrument of prayer that you have entrusted to us. Help us in prayer and by our supplications and with thanksgiving to make all of our requests made known unto you. And give us, Lord, the peace that passes all understanding. Guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Help us to focus and fix our minds upon the things, not that are troublesome, not that are distressing, not that cause division among us, but the things that are true, the things that are honorable, the things that are just and pure and lovely, commendable and excellent, worthy of praise. We pray, Lord, that we would have a desire to imitate the leaders in Christ who have set before us and to be transformed more and more into his image. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, for those in our midst who are sick and who are suffering, especially those, Lord, who are part of this body or connected to us in some way. For Alma, for Kay, for Doris, for Gary, for Ron, for Diane, for Paul, for Glenn, Courtney, Colin, Kathleen, for Marilyn, for Pearl, for Arlene, for Donna, for Jenny, for Mario, for Pastor Morris. We lift up to, Lord, the families of Ron White's cousin, Richard, who departed this life the other day, and of our sister Beth's mother, Teresa, who departed life in this past week. And we pray, O oh God, that all who mourn their loss and all who feel the emptiness of their passing will find great comfort in the promise of the gospel and that their families now will not uh, argue or squabble, but draw together, O oh Lord, and as one, rest under your hand of grace in this time of sorrow. Lord, in your mercy. We pray, Lord, for our children. We ask, O oh God, that in the midst of a culture and a society, and even, we're sad to say, an educational system that, that more and more take, deprives them of the context of a biblical understanding of the, their world, that you would give them grace, that you would grant to them, O oh Lord, insight, that you would grant to them wisdom, that you would help the mothers and fathers to raise them up with grace and with patience, and with your sustaining help in those difficult moments, so that they too, our children and our grandchildren, will grow up to be mighty men and women of God. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, O oh Lord, we lift to you according to the mercy that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would give us contentment with our lots, and that you would strengthen our trust in your gracious will at work in our lives, and that our hearts would be able to rest and relax without fear and without dread and with worry in the peace that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Would you please rise as we continue with our service of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. You lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, because you have called us into a special community and gathered us at your table. Grant that we ever trust in the graciousness of your plan for our lives and firmly cling to the glorious hope of eternal life in your glorious presence. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. <laughs>
bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup when he had supped, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many, for the remission of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Lord, Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
sustain you. Just a reminder, we have Sunday school at 1015, continuing our study in the book of Revelation, and children's Sunday school in the children's room downstairs. Uh, also, the Wednesday night Bible study has picked up again, so Wednesday nights at 6.30, if you can join us, uh, that, would be, that would be marvelous. Um, and then also in the narthex there, you'll see the setup display for the Operation Christmas Child, which is done by uh, Franklin Graham's organization. We've been a part of that uh, for, for years now. So you take one of those shoe boxes, and there's a little list of things that they recommend that you can uh, put in there, and then they mail that and send that to a needy uh, boy or girl somewhere in the world. And uh, so take a look at that and grab one, if you will. Those are due back to the church by the first week in November. And if there are any folks listening at home that would like to participate in that, um, we can get you the box and the material. Just give, give the church a call. Any other announcements that need to be made? Yeah. Yes, Peter. Um, Dawn, can you join us up here, please? As, <laughs> what? I'm sorry, what? Wait, I need to <laughs> As many of you know that uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and specifically today is Pastor Appreciation Day. So we have a we have a card and a gift for Pastor Lynn, who unfortunately injured his knee and he couldn't be here with us today. So we'll give this to him at a later date. But uh, we appreciate his dedication to the ministry of our Lord. <laughs> and I'm sure Everybody who knows pastor and their wives know that who really runs the, the <laughs> We appreciate you making sure he's buttoned and zipped up. <laughs> but but the, the selflessness um, that must take when he gets called away from meetings and, and phone calls and all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. And to Pastor Oswald. Has it been about four years now? Four, four years, years I've been here. Right. I think Hope is truly blessed that God has sent you to us here at Hope. Um, we, it's clearly evident your love of uh, love of the Word in your Bible classes and your sermons, and, and uh, how well what a, what a wonderful teacher you are. So we have a we have a gift for you. Uh, there's lots of cards, lots of cards, and emails in the states. Look at that. I, I like the, the Home Depot gift card that says, no one stacks up to you. <laughs> now be careful. Be careful. <laughs> but we really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we really appreciate everything you guys do for Hope. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For Bible class, if everybody comes to Bible class after, there's going to be a luncheon. Um, sandwiches, everything's individually wrapped. Uh, should be uh, fairly COVID friendly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're going to have a luncheon after Bible class. So if you can yeah. stay, uh, we welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how you pulled this off. It just goes to prove I don't know what's going on here. Pastor. <laughs> right here. And just so you know that the four years that Pastor was here began when he came to visit the church, they retired in the area. Ed Holmstrom was the only one here at church. He was working downstairs at the Brock Fry, I believe. And uh, knock came on the door downstairs and Pastor came in. You know, four years ago we were looking to call a pastor, gathering things and getting ready to call a pastor. And uh, Ed gave me a telephone call after that, and he said, there's someone that you have to speak with. I was chairman of the elders at the time. Well, I called Pastor. We had a very, very nice conversation, and the rest is history. We want to certainly thank him for being here. Well, he's in the Lord. Thank you, God.